Predecessors and the Origins of Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex Cinema. La Causa, Seeking Labor, Educational and Political Justice. As U.S. citizens, Chicanos and their ancestors have been racialized for the purposes of marginalization, an internal indigenous mestizo group repackaged and wrongfully depicted as foreign. This misrepresentation became prominent particularly around 1848 after the Mexican-American War. Racialization is employed for precise political reasons. For example, when the U.S. government was drafting for wars, Chicano and Mexicans were considered legally white, and then there were other times when they were not all depending on what was convenient. The Chicano experience with marginalization and racialization is twofold. First, indigenous and black mestizos have and continue to withstand the oppression and marginalization imposed on our Mexican indigenous and black identities and during the invention of Mexico as European mestizo through a white supremacist project of Europeanization. In fact, Mexico once had an Austrian emperor, Maximilian I, He was installed by French Emperor Napoleon III, and from 1864 to his execution in 1867, Maximiliano forwarded the process toward a modern and Eurocentric Mexico. As a side note, this point is where we see the first use of the word Latino imposed as an identity, attempting to override the ties to Spain and strengthen those to France through our use of Romance languages related to Latin. This project of Europeanization continued to another level in the late 1800s and early 1900s through the nationalist projects of dictator Porfirio Diaz, who literally began to turn Mexico into a version of France, including city buildings, streets, fashion, education, law, and a form of social and political life that emulated that of the French. On a second turn of events, indigenous and black mestizos have had and continue to endure the struggle against the Eurocentric and white supremacist settler expansion of the U.S. into Mexico, an attempt to homogenize and anglicize culture, language, and American identity as a whole, as well as a Eurocentric appropriation of the ownership and rights over lands and territories which had been inhabited by indigenous nations and indigenous and black mestizos, and even before the Anglos, by Spanish, Europeans, and European mestizos who settled in spite of the sovereign American Indian nations who had lived there for thousands of years before them. For example, there is evidence that the Tipai Ipai Kumiai of Southern California and Northern Baja have been living in the region for over 600 generations. That's about 10,000 years. In this second instance, in order to delete our direct ties and history to these territories and our indigenous cultures, we were all labeled as Spanish, then Hispanic and Latino. Some of us have a lineage in indigeneity, even when we do not belong to a certified tribe. Some of us are descendants of those who escaped and hid and were too fearful, too terrorized to come forward when the government made calls for indigenous people to become certified. We were born from the forced settlement. We did not come here to settle. We do not sympathize with the Eurocentric mission, nor do we acknowledge Spanish culture as our own. And we share in the struggle against coloniality with our indigenous and American Indian relations who are conscious of the struggle. Because even some of those certified indigenous people abide by coloniality, its demarcations and hierarchies. The Chicano identity is a response to these complex and historically imposed labels and the resulting marginalization and dehumanization of brown people subjected to the myth of mestizaje. Some Chicanos do not accept Afro-Chicanos as real Chicanos because they have internalized coloniality, but some of us do. We know from history and from the stories our families pass on that the violent mestizaje and the resulting U.S. experience which fell on the indigenous mestizo Chicano was parallel to that of the black Chicano and yes, even that of the brown Asian Chicano. Chicano Chicano identity reclaims our ties to this land and our indigeneity or belonging to the lineage of indigenous peoples of America or to those people who were forced to become tools for the foundation of this supremacist nation. This is why Chicano identity extends beyond the Mexican-American to the Caribbean, South American, Filipino, and people with other border identities who have been key actors in the Chicano movement. The Chicano Movement El Movimiento was a social and political movement inspired by the maintenance and recovery of our history, the history of resistance that had been hidden from us. The Chicano movement was directly inspired by the Pachucos, or suit suitors of the 1940s, and the Black Panther movement. The Chicano movement was about embracing our identity, being proud, community empowerment, and the rejection of assimilation, a completely decolonial, anti-colonial project. In order to educate and empower Chicanos, 
There was an insurgence of a Chicano mythopoetic discourse, one composed of the parts that have been rescued from oblivion, a restructuring of history that longs to reconnect and build consciousness by linking Chicanos to our lost indigenous ties. This has been done by linking Chicano identity to the indigenous American empires of the Mexica or Aztec. Many indigenous relations live longing for their indigenous culture, knowledge, and ways, yet they do not know how to recover what was taken from them. Similarly to those of African-American origin who are torn from their cultural past, they find themselves in a liminal space, in a perpetual in-between constructed by coloniality. The Mexica culture is the only reference they have towards their lost relations. This is done with respect and a painful longing. The mixture of languages, Spanglish, is also a way, or the rejection of Spanish, or the rejection of speaking English with an Anglo accent is precisely a form of resistance to make ourselves visible. We exist, and as a result, we embrace these fragmentary expressions of ourselves. Like Koyo Shauki, we exist in the fragmentary, and the fragmented is our power source. Knowing we do not belong here or there fully, we take the pieces we are left with, and we use them to formulate an effort, a movement to liberate ourselves from Eurocentric concepts of clearly bordered and demarcated identity. The Chicano movement was mainly fueled by the consciousness of an intergenerational legacy of lucha or struggle that survived the suppression of our black and indigenous roots within an ongoing struggle to resist and fight against any attempts to blur our experiences, our presence, history, impact, and contributions to the U.S. and the world. El Movimiento took place in the late 60s, and it has taken these many years to have a significant amount of people who will teach our history and demands in higher education. Currently, only about 4% of tenured professors across the United States are Chicana or Latina. There is much more work to be done, and we must begin with reminding our communities that this struggle is ongoing. To help people understand what being Chicano is all about leads to the second attribute of Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx sensibility, a strong social, historical, and political Chicano discourse. Chicano discourse is mapped in terms of, one, the specific and non-discursive, for example, institutional power relations which gave rise to it. This refers to the oppressive circumstances not being counted or listened to, the abuses which made Chicanos enter survival mode and begin to stand up for themselves as a mass. Two, the status given to individual speakers of Chicano discourse. We must give value and appropriate attention to each other even after we have been taught that we have nothing of value to say. Interestingly, you will find that some of the most marginalizing groups could be in fact identifying as Chicano. Why is this? It is because in their longing to maintain the traditional discourse and be validated as official, they forget they may also ignore speakers that are bringing the new voices into Chicanismo, and they're actually the actors who will bring it up to date. Three, the concepts to which it refers. Chicano comes with concepts that have finally named the things that we experience as a people. These concepts have not only been defined and evidenced, but they have been theorized on and related to broader and larger discourses, such as the one on decoloniality. Four, the strategies that define its struggle with Chicanismo. Chicano studies discourse is discussed, focusing on the micro-mechanisms by which the discourse of Chicano scholars is appropriated and robbed of its power in order to deflect its impact on public policy. Chicano discourse will always be political, when those who are not supposed to speak do not just speak, but sing loudly. Pride and self-determination are behind the force of Chicanismo, especially Chicano films. We can trace these origins to oral history and musicality of which a continuous example is El Corrido Fronterizo the border ballad, El Corrido Fronterizo. The border corrido marks a poetic tradition of resistance. This tradition provides the canon with an identity-based contour for Chicano historiography, which as you can see is based on oral traditions of historical record keeping and sharing. Corridos were a way for marginalized Mexicans and Mexican Americans to express and archive their oral history, perspective, and a tradition of expressing that which was taking place politically and socioeconomically and yet excluded from the dominant white supremacist discourse, which was representing Mexican resistance and reactions negatively by satanizing that what was then oversimplified as Spanish, Hispanic identity in the most negative light possible. Corridos told collective history from the perspective of the marginalized. Mexicans were peons who were at the bottom of the social scale. This was a continuation of the caste systems imposed during colonial times, joined by the white supremacist thinking of Anglo settlers, which devalued indigenous and black and Mexican life. A Texas Ranger sergeant was known to have said on record that Mexican life is of little value. They believed in shooting first and asking questions later. They would lynch Mexicans and anyone that looked Mexican to them. That was their method. The 1901 
10-day manhunt of the criminalized Gregorio Cortez was one of the largest in history. His story is symbolic of the struggles of Mexican Americans being dehumanized, attacked, and subjected to violence, and then being judged by the white supremacist Anglo-American eye when attempting to stand up to their violence. He epitomized the archetype of hero, the man who defends his rights with a pistol in his hands, who escapes at the end or confronts all impossible odds, a victor even in defeat, a man with agency. These oral traditions never stop. They remained strong in what may appear to be an underground format, yet corridos were always out in the open. It is that the oral forms themselves were either not understood or simply ignored by the dominant Anglo-centric society. The seemingly covert forms themselves represent a border format that has been passed on generationally, sometimes consciously embodied, sometimes unconsciously. This Chicano border sensibility became acknowledged in dominant discourses and practices that they challenged, such as in academia, film, art, and mass media. Its subtext is, and I quote from Chon Noriega, who's quoting Michel Foucault, that which speaks verbosely of its own silence. Ramon Saldivar claims that the corrido became the preeminent form of action and resistance against the ever-increasing political and cultural hegemony of Anglo-American society. Corridos resisted in the mouths of El Pueblo, not within dominant media forms. They reside as a repressed element of the political unconscious. The corrido exerts a powerful symbolic force in the sphere of alternative narrative arts. El corrido is about an alternate avenue for expression, one that speaks our version of history, a story existing in spite of the framed and established by the dominant culture of European settlers. The corrido is formal, public, and masculine. Chicano Studies locates its origins in Américo Paredes' 1958 book, With His Pistol in His Hand, A Border Ballad and Its Hero. In it, Paredes documents the corrido tradition, something which had not been considered worthy of academic study, by providing an extended analysis of the ballad of Gregorio Cortés. The corrido represents a mainly masculine oral folk narrative that Chicano scholars have argued is a master poem for Chicano literature. As a legacy of subversive and invisibilized oral traditions of resistance, Chicano cinema is an extension and continuation of the Chicano movement, El Movimiento, and thus also of the oral musical tradition and the photograph tradition beyond El Corrido found within indigenous technologies of iconographic, history-keeping, and visual language systems. Chicano studies is the study of this sensibility. Social political Chicano resistance movements found their inspiration in the same oral, musical, and other artistic traditions of resistance. Major examples include the rise of Mexican miners and la lucha of farm workers who fought for labor justice from the 50s until today, and the rise of Chicano youth in the 1968 Chicano blowouts or East LA walkouts demanding for justice in education. It is for this reason that some claim that the first Chicano film was not actually made by a Chicano, but it centralized the Chicano experience in such a way that it carried the Chicano sensibility forward. This film was The Salt of the Earth from 1954, directed by Herbert J. Biberman, a film showcasing a social realism documenting the lives of Chicanos during the Cold War period, experiencing a worker labor struggle in Sinktown, New Mexico. For the first time, we saw a film that critically centralized the struggles and hierarchies that were the continuation of the project of modernity found in coloniality, the role of women and their oppression within the home are also represented openly and critically. The film was banned for many years. It came out in 1954 and it did not become available until the late 1960s. It was banned because during that time there was an anti-communist movement in Hollywood. The film was made by filmmakers that were labeled as communists. Violence and intimidation were used to try to stop the filming. The term anti-communist came to mean repression of Mexican-American labor organizing in the Southwest and Midwest, primarily by communists influencing labor unions. Yet, the mission of these unions, beside labor rights, included addressing political and social inequality in the mining towns of Grant County. Anti-communism was a code word that referred to the efforts to push Mexican-Americans and Chicanos quote-unquote back in their place. The production of the film was co-directed with the actual mine workers that came out in it as actors as well. This experience of marginalization is what ends up pushing forth a transformation of political class, gender, and race consciousness, which ultimately was what led to political organizing and the miners' strike, which lasted years, about three to four years.
A similar thing happens with farm workers. As a legacy of colonialism and hierarchical placement of the races, farm workers were dehumanized and denied any type of humanity, much more any labor rights. During World War II, the Bracero Program, an agreement between Mexico and the United States, made it possible for Mexican farm workers to work and live in the United States to help maintain an agricultural economy. There are documented attempts to organize farm workers from the 1940s and 50s led by Ernesto Galarza. Yet the Braceros were marginalized to such a degree that any efforts were made impossible by the growers' abuses. It was not until the 1960s that Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez unionized the farm workers and allied together with Filipino, black, and white farm workers and other unions, including community groups that were on the same struggle for civil and labor rights. They wanted to put a stop to the Bracero program because of the amount of abuses this made possible, but also because they were under the impression that the Mexican workers would diminish El Movimiento. They were wrong, as the Mexican workers actually only made them stronger. The types of abuses included not being able to use the restroom, no portable restrooms, making them work with little to no water, forcing them to share the same cup, making them pay to use cups, and the people were paid 90 cents an hour plus 10 cents per basket picked while being charged $2 or more per day for the rental of temporary housing shacks with no plumbing and no kitchens. Children were exploited and workers were injured or died in easily preventable accidents. The life expectancy of a farm worker was about 49 years. The National Farm Workers Association was started in 1962 by both Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez. They went town to town for three years, meeting with farm workers in their homes, building an organization that one day became an effective union. The picketing and strike of the farm workers together with the boycott of grapes helped put pressure on the growers. They built a union that exists until this day, the United Farm Workers. The corrido style was in fact used to fuel farm workers movement with songs like No nos moverán, We shall not be moved, Yo soy chicano, I am chicano, and El corrido del bracero, the bracero ballad. Some of these songs taking the same exact music from songs of the Mexican Revolution and repurposing them for the Chicano movement. Reconnecting the past with the present was also done via written word in independent Chicano publications. La Raza magazine was founded in 1967 by Cuban Elisier Risco in Lincoln Heights, East Los Angeles. Risco was also an organizer with the UFW and had worked with Cesar Chavez and playwright Luis Valdez. Luis Valdez would present plays out of the back of pickup trucks. These plays would portray the injustices that farm workers endured and created a consciousness in the audiences. Risco also worked on El Malcriado, the UFW newspaper. The farm workers movement became a training ground for Chicano artists and activists. It was to repackage a certain sensibility that would be continued and carried forward within Chicano media and art. La Raza magazine incorporated historical accounts of resistance as well as personal expressions of quotidian Chicano experiences and life in Los Angeles. Other underground Chicano press publications included El Grito del Norte, El Machete, La Revolución, El Popo, and Ana Nieto Gómez's Las Hijas de Cuauhtémoc. 
La raza focused on representing the Chicano experience and critiquing racism against Chicanos, and particularly within education. They began to write thinking about informing and empowering an even younger high school audience. After this, in March of 1968, the East LA blowouts occurred. Another significant event of El Movimiento was the Chicano Moratorium of 1970. During Chicano protests against Vietnam, to which brown and black youth were disproportionately drafted and purposely placed in the front lines, the police began a riot against the people. Journalist Ruben Salazar was assassinated by a gas canister the police shot into the Silver Dollar Saloon where he was having a drink. The police were after Salazar due to his fearless reporting of issues concerning Chicanos, something which had never been done before in the mainstream. He was an investigative journalist who was critical of the LA government and their treatment of Chicanos. He investigated the police who had planted evidence to implicate Chicanos and a July 1970 shooting of two unarmed Mexicans. The police would constantly intimidate him. Due to his support of the Chicano movement, Salazar became a target of the FBI, which opened a subject file on him. This leads to believe this was a targeted assassination. Although the coroner ruled it a homicide, the deputy that killed Salazar was never prosecuted. Raul Ruiz, the then editor of La Raza magazine, was there and informed Chicano activists as he reported on these events. This changed the route of the movement from walking out and marching to actual strategic political organization. This took to the creation of La Raza Unida Party, founded in Crystal City, Texas, by five young men who had been part of Mayo, Mexican-American youth organization, Jose Angel Gutierrez, Mario Compeán, William Velasquez, Ignacio Perez, and Juan Patlan. La Raza Unida was a third party alternative to the Republican and Democrat parties. La Raza Magazine worked with La Raza Unida Party. It was due to these, among many other events of the Chicano movement and their coverage and linking to our historical truths, that a visual iconography for Chicanismo is created. The Chicano movement, El Movimiento, marks the preamble to Chicano film. The fight for labor rights of workers such as minors, farm workers, and the concurrent fight for education rights, the rights of brown and black soldiers in the Vietnam War, and the right to have a political party that represents Chicanos. In turn, the Chicano civil rights movement was inspired by the unearthing and reconnecting La Raza to our hidden histories and the legacy of Mexican-American identity and struggles in the United States, all in order to push forth La Causa Chicana that produced the Chicano sensibility that makes Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex films the way they are. Chicana, Chicano, Chicanex films are continuing this tradition in that they are representing our experience Yet, as you watch Chicano films, I must ask you to think about those stories that are yet to be told and to think about other ways in which they can be told that might bring us closer in this day and age into a more socially just existence. Tengo mi orgullo, tengo mi fe, soy